My goodness, you all are a terrific audience. <laughs> I want to do a presentation today. <laughs> I'm sorry you missed Miss America Friday. We had a lot of fun. I hope I think we did. I did. I'm Blair from Learning Quest, and it's my great privilege to be the coordinator for this class today. Uh, it is a continuation of a program that we started back in the year of the Bicentennial for Alabama when we did a series, I think we did five or six, and John was able to come and have one all to himself then to present what he's going to read from today. But we, the series was called Read to Me, Alabama, and we chose Alabama writers. And of course, John being a native son, he fits the bill from top to bottom. Let me remind you of a few things. It's a big crowd. We all probably have cell phones. Please remember to cut off your sound. We only have a, a, an hour with John, although I think he is agreeable to uh, staying a little bit longer. As far as comments and questions, which many of you, maybe all of you may have, John agrees to let you interrupt during the hour or however many minutes we're here for you to comment and to ask. So uh, please feel free to do so. I don't think I've missed anything except to say thank you, thank you, thank you to a couple of people. First of all, to Jane Jones, who is our AV person. She's the one that lights us and gives us sound. And I appreciate her so very much. Also, Daryl Tibbs is not in the room, I don't think, but I mean, Daryl. Palm. Palm. Daryl Tibbs is somebody else that I know here. Daryl's outside. Well, Daryl is commended and thanked highly for uh, helping with negotiations for this meeting. So without much of you, because I could say a lot of things about John, and almost all of them are good, I think we just disagree on one point. Uh, if we had adult adopt adoption in Alabama, he would be my, my choice. <laughs> go with my two daughters. I just want to read briefly from an opinion that was, that appeared in the uh, Huntsville Times when his book first came out. I think it had been on the market maybe a little over a month. And his friend, um, is it Dan Carson, wrote a lovely, lovely review of the book. And it might have been with a little prejudice, but I don't think so. Having read the book, of course, I'm not prejudiced when it comes to John. But the article, um, Starts, it's time to read, think, then shake your own gates. John's book was written with love, and I just adored reading it. I hope you all will read it too. John, take it away. You know, every time we have uh, appeared in the same room or virtual room lately, Blair said, you know, we agree on all but one thing, but she won't tell me what that one thing is. <laughs> so, I mean, don't y'all want to know what it is? Yeah. Uh, you know, last time I was, uh, I guess last time I was here, I was here for your, uh, your theatrical, what, what's the name of the? Reader's Theater. Reader's Theater, in which you uh, look at famous Alabamians and the role they played there, and it was so convincing to me that when, Arnita came up and got a book signed. I signed it to Claudia Coleman, which was <laughs> something that uh, that uh, it probably isn't good. But um, so yeah, she said, "Ask questions when you have questions," and, and I hope you will because to me, um, the whole thing was written for the purpose of conversation. I mean, because I think we need to have conversations, and um, and and often we have. Uh, in the South, particularly, I think that we, uh, we don't talk about so many things historically. We don't talk about issues of race. We don't talk about issues of sexuality. We don't talk about issues of mental illness. We don't talk about uh, 
uh, issues of, you know, just dirty laundry. We don't talk about a lot of things, and it's my uh, sort of opinion. And, I, and, uh, and it's my opinion that when we, when we uh, don't talk about those things, we give them a power over us that they shouldn't have. So, um, so anything you want to ask me, any criticisms you might have, any times you think I'm an idiot, any times you think I'm not. Um, I, uh, especially the not, right? But, uh, but don't hesitate to ask me anything or talk, or, you know, or to simply make a comment about how this, uh, you know, makes you think or feel. Um, because cause that's my goal in this, is to get people talking about things um, because I think that that helps us to understand and to deal with them. So, um, with that said, um, how many of y'all have read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail? Libraries are great, man. Because <laughs> you know, I go to a lot of a lot of groups, and and, and the and the answer the the, the hands are much short, small, uh, fewer. Um, but I, I just wanted to read a couple of pieces because that's when I grew up. I was born in 1963, and I grew up all around North Alabama, but. Um, in Birmingham in a lot of ways, and, th and none of this was talked about then. It was as if it did not occur, particularly in the, uh, among white people of my particular age group. We didn't live through it, we, uh, we lived after it, and a lot of people wanted to just move on. So we didn't talk about it. So it was, I was fully grown before I really absorbed this letter, and it was really through my work that I came to understand it and to came to really appreciate it. But uh, I just want to read a couple of passages from it. When he was, for, it, for the few said, who, who didn't raise their hands, I mean, it's, it, it is both a, a really important uh, letter that was written to a group of uh, clergy who had essentially told Martin Luther King to wait a little while, we get this under control. Uh, before you come and protest in Birmingham and, and that sort of thing. And he responded to them from his jail cell where he was, uh, where he was put in solitary confinement for parading without a permit uh, and wrote this, this without the benefit of, uh, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica, much less the Internet, uh, you know, in, in 11 days after my birth. And, and so in that, but it was also, so it was a, it was, it was a letter that talked, it gave, you know, outlined the need for protest, but also really excoriated the white church for its failure to act or to be supportive or to even acknowledge uh, that this incredible thing was happening in this moment, incredible moment, uh, in this incredible place. And so, um, so all, uh, this is work in my head, but let me just read the, the thing. I've, I've, reached, I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion, excuse me, that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is an absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And all those, uh, I mean, in that, uh, you know, that said a lot to me, but you know, to, to, to know why, I guess, um, I was, uh, my dad was a Methodist preacher in North Alabama, and his dad was a Methodist preacher in North Alabama, I just talked to somebody from Florence, who yeah, was there. Uh, his dad was a Methodist, all, all of these are moderately successful, pretty successful Methodist preachers. His father was a Methodist preacher in North Alabama, his father was a Methodist preacher. If you go back farther than that, it was a, a uh, uh, Episcopal pre uh, Presbyterian preacher, and so they go back all the way before the 1750s. Uh, on my mother's side, my hip, my mother's father was a Methodist preacher. Got an uncle who's a Methodist preacher. I got an aunt who's a Methodist preacher. 
I got a niece who's a Methodist preacher, and, well, and then there's me, but, um, <laughs> but so, you know, we, we grew up, I mean, it was our entire identity, being the Methodist preacher. My dad was at First Methodist in Decatur, First Methodist in Huntsville, First Methodist in Jacksonville. I mean, when you're the First Methodist preacher family, particularly in those days, I mean, you know, you thought you were somebody, right? You know, so uh, we thought we were somebody. And we had to be, I mean, me excluded, because I was the, I was the uh, you know, preacher's kids come in two distinct fashions. There's those who go on to be the next line of Methodist preachers, and those, and those who steal the communion grape juice when Dad's not looking. At and I was the one who was sitting in the balcony holding up the watch at 11, 15, 12, 15, uh, so that we could beat the Baptists to the Pioneer Cafeteria. You know, so, um, I was that kind of guy. But, but I think in reading this letter the first time, um, you know, because King... He talked about the need for protest. He talked about the lack of uh, uh, a voice from people who should be on board, who believed, who believed well. But then he talked about the church and the silence. And this is the part that really resonated with me when I started thinking about this book. Um, and I'll just read what he said about that part of it. I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright oppo opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious community that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern would serve as the channel through which our just grievances could reach the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. And it goes on. Uh, and I'm going to read this next one just because it's, it's rare that people can put such wisdom in such beauty in words, in my view. So, uh, on sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I've looked at the South's beautiful churches and their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of our massive religious education buildings. Over and over, I've found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who's their God? Where's their voice? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to, to bright hills of creative protest? And I, you know, I, I, I guess I've read the letter from Martin Luther, I've read the letter from Birmingham Jail 25 or 50 times through my career. Uh, because I wrote about it a lot, you know, in, the, in my career. Um, and I never, for whatever reason, went to my dad, who was, uh, like I say, one of the good ones, <laughs> um, who was a minister in Birmingham, Alabama, just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. And April of 1963, in what was known as the Children's Crusade, when Dr. King was jailed and children were arrested and dogs and fire hoses <laughs> made international news. And I never said, what were you saying from your pulpit when, when this was happening? Because in my mind, we were the good ones. Uh, he was, I knew in the 70s that he had integrated the uh, Cub Scout troop in Decatur and that he insisted that I go to the first desegregated schools. And, and I knew what he felt because I knew what he talked to me about justice and equality of all people. So I assumed he was the good one. We were the good ones. We were the ones on the right side. So I never, and again, I, when, I, when I'm looking back here, I'm not looking to condemn uh, because you can't put yourself in another place in another time and know with any degree of certainty 
how you would behave, how you would react, what would you have the strength to say. But you can take a look back, particularly with my, in my opinion, at the person I admire most in the world, and say, and the person I thought had the most strength of any person I've ever known in the world, and say, wow, what could make you maybe not seeing the person I know in this other time, and how will I use that to determine what I'm going to do today and tomorrow? And so, um, so, so that's what it did. And, and um, in some ways, I thought that I would, I would never. I mean, my dad died in 2013, and um, and like I said, I, I put him way up here. I'm gonna, if, I, if we have time, I'm going to read a little piece to show you who I think he is and why I admire him. But um, but I thought I would never, never know the answer to what were you saying from your pulpit in, uh, in this important time. And, and, and I started thinking about it because at this, at this particular time, I mean, when I was making this book proposal, it was 2018. And um, I had been really thinking a lot about silence. Um, and, that, and really in that letter from Birmingham Jail, um, because what it's saying is, where were you when I needed your voice? Um, and particularly, if you, you, you know, he's talking to people who say, you think like I do, but you're not there for me. Um, and that hurts worse than hearing somebody say, I hate everything you're saying and I disagree with you, because, you know, you can reconcile that. Um, but, uh, but, I, uh, so I sat down and I was saying the silence because, I mean, how, what do we know? I mean, it, I mean it's, it's hard in this world right now sometimes to talk about these issues of race and talk about these other things, particularly now when, when there's been, you know, 2020 happened and there was, for this brief moment, of an, an appearance that there had been sort of a breakthrough and people began to understand more about the complexities of racial issues after George Floyd, and it was, seemed like they told us it was a racial reckoning uh, and all this, and now, you know, it's back to let's not talk about history, or let's we put it all on critical race theory, and let's, uh, let's not examine ourselves too closely or we might not like what we see. Um, which doesn't make any sense to me because I think you have to know the problem before you can create a solution. But I digress. At any rate, I was thinking a lot about silence because, and thinking, you know, what, what, you know, it, what would have happened throughout, you know, the last 150 years if if people who were more compassionate or people who uh, cared more about justice stood up to to talk, and, and specifically white people in Alabama. Uh, had stood up against, you know, and said, when, when the Alabama Constitution was written, and said, um, this Constitution is specifically dying, designed to encode white supremacy in law, what would have happened if, if people had said, you know, I don't think that's right. Um, you know, Jim Crow, lynchings, uh, Tuskegee, none of these things, uh, the, uh, could these things have happened if white people of conscience had said, I don't think that's right. Um, the you know people talk about Birmingham as bombing him, and they think it's the I think they were talking about the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing that killed four little girls. But Birmingham was known as bombing him long before that. Mm -hmm. There were four, more than 40 bombs in Birmingham between 1945 and 1965, um, and no arrests. Um, and so you know what so. That's what was going through my mind. What can happen when people of goodwill simply decide they can't make a difference, they don't want to risk making a difference, they're afraid to make a difference, they don't feel like they have voice, they have a pulpit, and they don't use it. Um, and so that... It's really what made me want to take a deeper look at the man I love the most in all the world who had a pulpit and did he use it in this time and this place. 
And uh, like I said, I thought I wouldn't get to do that, but using my long honed and carefully crafted, brilliant um, <laughs> investigative reporting skills, I walked into my basement and saw the file cabinet that my dad that I'd had since my dad died with white duct tape across the front and two inch letters that said daddy sermons across the front and I figured well you know I didn't hear those as a kid maybe I should read them <laughs> and uh, so I sat down to do it and uh, this is where I'm lucky my dad was a Methodist and I didn't understand this so much at the time but you know Methodists move all the time you know they particularly back in the day two to five years you know there until you got to a you know, you climb the, the ladder of what I think I refer to as Jesus LLC right. and you uh, <laughs> get to a certain point where you know it's harder to move so we were you know I, I was born in Alabaster moved to Huntsville Montesano moved to Jacksonville moved to Decatur moved to Birmingham um, and then I was gone, and they moved on to Tuscaloosa and Huntsville. Um, Blah. But when you're reading all of the sermons, that comes in handy because I found out that he would. Pray. Some of those sermons were used nine separate times, <laughs> and, and so my dad was fastidious in his record keeping, and he would he would type them out, and he would line through them and make notes and the dates he used them and have the dates of all the different churches and citations and all those uh, which is again y'all interrupt me because you know wind me up and stuff comes out of my mouth um, but uh, I the first sermon I read I believe was from uh, it was from April or early May of 1963 Again, I would have been a baby, just a newborn. My dad was at Alabaster, 23 miles from Birmingham City Hall. Dr. King was in jail. Um, thousands of children had been arrested in Birmingham for you know, leaving schools, leaving homes, sneaking out um, to protest with Dr. King and Fred Shuttlesworth. And it happened to coincide with Children's Sunday on the Methodist Church calendar, um, which is, you know, sort of a guy they give that says, you know, hey, it'd be good to talk about kids today, right? So, um, so he preached on Children's Sunday at the precise moment in time. And again, it's hard to know what moment in time is important today. I understand that. But on Children's Sunday, in the cradle of the Civil Rights Movement, at that critical moment in time, he preached on Children's Sunday. And he talked about the anguish of the world. And he talked about the anguish in Asia, in South America, and um, all over the world, except outside the stained glass windows of his church and maybe inside the stained glass windows and in the pews of his church as well. Because it's way harder, I mean, maybe it's way easier to examine trouble when it is far away than it is when it's looking right back at you in the aisles. And so, I mean, I was shocked. I mean, shocked may be overstating. And I was disappointed to read that. But, uh, but so I read, went on to read more and more. And I started by just reading, picking out the important moments of the, the Civil Rights Movement, whether that's, uh, you know, Selma, whether that's the Voting Rights Act, whether that's the 16th Street Church bombing, whether that's every other bombing, you know, that occurred in the United States at, at, at Civil Rights Service houses in Birmingham in those days, uh, the very young bus burnings, all these things. So, uh, uh, um, and, uh, and what stood out to me was the most was the silence of it. And, um, and so um, I, I set out to find out why that was. And uh, 
Frederick Outlaw helped me a lot. And that Frederick Outlaw is a black Methodist preacher who grew up with my dad and um, was, uh, is important to the book and important to my sort of being able to deal with the book because I was so, uh, she's a friend, he's a neighbor, uh, not a friend. And, uh, and, um, and, and to talk, I think he's the one who talked about, you know, uh, um, that every war needs, uh, you know, soldiers and it needs diplomats and it needs people who can go in and change um, uh, perceptions and that sort of thing. And he, he, he told me uh, that my dad was definitely in, in the army, just not in the, in the, in the out front side of that. But, uh, but you know, that, I talked to a lot of, of preachers about why this might be, about why, about why somebody who, I, who felt so strongly about justice could be so silent. And there are a lot of different reasons. And, um, uh, but they all, they all, almost to a one, told me that, you know, he did it for you. <laughs> He did it because uh, because those who spoke out, whether preachers, whether Methodist preachers, whether other preachers, uh, whether in the boardrooms, whether uh, you know elsewhere, people who spoke out were often, and certainly among preachers at, the, at Methodist preachers at that time, were relegated. Uh, they hurt their careers. Some were kicked out of town. Some were kicked out of state. Some had crosses burned. Some had. You know, and, and of course, you, you know, um, they tell me, you know, he did it for you, uh, so you could have a better life, which which didn't make me feel better, honestly. <laughs> it made me feel complicit, um, and uh, I, that that uh, because you know, once they, you know, you honestly, because I see images of John Lewis getting his head beaten across and having his head and pet his bridge. And, and I see Martin Luther King getting shot down, and I see um, a guy named Charles Morgan and uh, a white lawyer from Birmingham who gave a speech the day after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing uh, that really essentially said, all of you, all of us, who, um, and I, the whole the family let me use the whole speech in the book, and to me that's my favorite part because uh, every time I read it, I cry because it seems so true. Um, that because we kept our mouths shut, because we laughed at jokes, because we sat in pews and listened to parables and didn't take them to heart, um, we didn't change anything. And um, and so uh, so I, I didn't. But I did. But I did find out that there was just an incredible amount of pressure, which we call a conspiracy of silence, to. Uh, to keep these issues out of mainstream churches in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, one of the pro professor I quoted here talks about, you know, the Methodists in particular are real big on keeping politics out of the pulpit. Um, but as he points out, that's a very political decision. It's a decision that says, I'm not going to go there. Um, and uh, so, And I understand strategies, and I understand that, but sometimes you've got to go there. And that's, a, that's, that's sort of the point. Um, but uh, let me, uh, I've I battled on for a while. Let me just read uh, a little bit about my dad so you'll know a little bit about what I think of him. Um, it would have been nice if I had... Marx. <laughs> uh, yeah, I still can't, uh, still can't quote it. Uh, you were up on Monsanto. We were. And you were still a young boy. I was. And you had a dog. We always had a dog. We lived next door to the church. Did you go to any of his... Uh, no, I was nowhere around. I was in California. Oh. My mother, in 19... What, 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 what year was that? Two that was, we, went, we came to Monte Sano in late 1963. So you were real. In middle, not late, in uh, summer of 1963. 
So yeah, I lived in Alabaster for three months and then we moved to Monty Center. The house was right next to the Monty Center. On Panorama Drive. Is that right? No, on Fern Street. It did burn? Fern. 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 F -A -R -M Street. It's the, it's the dead end from uh, Bankhead. I'll show you where you <laughs> Anyway, I'm talking about the church and the fact that you had a dog and our my parent, mother, took an instant dislike to your dog. <laughs> <laughs> and she named him Archibald. <laughs> Sometimes they'll come over and you know really see how things are going. And we always have, we, and I brought home this baby Saint Bernard when we were living in Birmingham, and it grew up to be a big Saint Bernard, <laughs> and it ate the couch, and it was a, not a not a good thing. Oh man. Well, I mean, any, I mean, if, if y'all y'all want to, anybody have any questions, or I can just yeah. I believe that the Methodist Church before the Civil War had played an important role in the um, uh, suppression of, of uh, rights uh, well, uh, in uh, supporting slavery. And maybe your parent, your father, was, um, and the Methodist Church down here was having, um, you know, residual. Um, memories of that connection, and maybe that's also influenced the fact that, that they had a tendency to not um, take action at that time. I mean, yeah, and there, and there was, I mean, and I, I didn't realize, it, I mean, of course, you know, there was, and then the, there was the split, and there was the AME church and the CME church that uh, were not affiliated for years with the uh, uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, which preceded the Methodist Church, which preceded the, which preceded the United Methodist Church, um, and not to get too far deep in the weeds, but you know it was 1968. Um, you know, five when the when the the Methodist Church became the United Methodist Church, and uh, it became integrated. Really, you know. Uh, so what? 13 years after Brown versus the Board of Education, this didn't affect that. But I mean, we, the Methodist Church really desegregated slower than a lot of, than the schools did. So, um, but um, but you know, in some ways, but I, but, but I, and this just reminded me. It's not specifically about what you said, but when I was trying to figure out why my dad was silent, people said, you know, he did it for y'all. He did it, you know, because. Uh, uh, Keep politics out of the pulpit, etc. I think it's because he loved the Methodist Church and all that. I mean, with all that language, he loved the Methodist Church like it was family. And the district superintendents at the time, the people who were um, cabinet members to the bishop, who who are the bosses of regular local ministers, um, were saying, "Don't talk about this." In the pulpit, you know, don't bring up the race issue. And I think he was, at his core, a company guy. And so that when a bishop came into Alabama and said, you know, permission to speak freely, everything changed. Mm -hmm. But, um, and others uh, say, uh, you know, that that gave them cover to talk more openly about these things too, which. I understand, um, 
that really doesn't get to the crux of the issue because there were people who were speaking out. There were people saying uh, what was on their conscience and in their heart, and they were, in many cases, punished by being relegated to smaller churches or being kept as associate pastors. And, and I talked to one in the book, one of my favorite guys, Enos Sellers, who went to Emory with my dad, and, um, and they became preachers together, and he got put on this list of undesirables for talking about race from the pulpit. Um, and I talked to him days before he died, and he said, you know, I was put on this list, and um, I was kept at small churches, but I was not called to preach at large churches. I was called to preach the gospel, and um, and this is in my heart. And he was, the, of all the people I talked to, he was the one who was really the most satisfied with his career as a preacher. Um, and one of the scariest things I did after this book published was go talk to, the, well, it was on Zoom, so it wasn't that scary. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I spoke to this group of retired Methodist ministers who were contemporaries of my dad, who all knew my dad, who grew up with him. And I was really concerned with how they would uh, react, you know? Because they knew him, they went through the same things. They knew him, and you know, three of them just, you know, burst into tears talking. And these are good. I mean, in my view, really good people who care about the right things. And they, they were just looking back, and they were just crying because they didn't think, not because they would be remembered badly, because they won't, but because they didn't think they did enough. They didn't think they were true to themselves. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I sort of take that as. A lesson sometimes, you know, um, sometimes it's hard to say the things that need to be said, but it's harder sometimes to live with the things you didn't say. Um, and, yeah. You know, it seems to me that we, we hold our churches sort of in higher esteem than us, but they're really no better than, than we are. I mean, they're an organization and a business. And they're going to do what's in their best interest. And, and I think that's what you're, you're telling us that the Methodist Church is like, but many of them are like Right. And, and I've heard from, you know, every denomination uh, and, and, and different faiths about going through the same thing. And, you know, there's, there's a constant struggle between, I mean, at the bottom line, most churches are a business. And, they, you know, and, and to deny, I mean, and I, I mean, there's a thousand caveats I give because I, number one, they pay me to say what I think. And I don't have to keep churches together. I don't have to keep butts in seats. I don't have to keep people putting money in the flesh away. Um, so I get that. Um, but, uh, but it is a, uh, a great frustration for a lot of people. And yeah, you're right. So I thought, I read your book. Thank you. But I thought the times you were a little harsh on your back. And I'll tell you, well, I know you love them. It just came out pretty clear in the book. But I strongly believe that sometimes you do things for your children. And I think, I thought of it more in that respect. He knew that there would be, I uh, had to pay for it if he spoke out and <coughs> um, about it. And I think that's. He loved you all, and I think that's where it came from. Um, because I think when he could, he did, and they were on when you were all wrong. Um, did y'all all hear that? Yeah. No. I think that's true. Um, and I had a great answer when you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, first of all, I, I hope you can imagine how it was for me writing this book and then waiting for it to publish for two years. Um, because on the one hand, I wanted to hold my father to account, if for no other reason than I, you know, people say it's a book about my dad, but to me, it's a book that uses my dad as a vehicle to talk about us. Um, and 
So, but I'm lying here in bed thinking, oh my God, am I holding into account enough? Or am I being way too harsh on him? Because again, he was everything to me. Um, and so ultimately, it was my, that's why I decided, I structured it in a weird way where I sort of like had a chapter about this quest for what he was saying. And then a chapter about how we knew him. A more personal chapter about family and and there's a lot of, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I mean, I hope that it, you know, I don't want it to be just all a history. I want it to be a, I want you to know him and to get some of the humor that's involved in some of these things. And, well, uh, no, and I, I hope that... I want to go to the cat. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but, but that, that was such a struggle for me. And uh, that, you know, the first half of it was that struggle. Oh, my God, am I doing enough? Oh, my God, am I doing too much? And then I got it published, and I was like, damn, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I was supposed to publish in 2020, and then George Floyd happened. And um, everything went crazy, and... 2020 was 2020, and it got put up, and the publication got put up. So you can imagine being a white guy who wrote a book in 2019 about race, largely, <laughs> and then lying in bed through 2020, wondering if you said the right thing, if the thing you said um, should be rephrased after that, or if, uh, if it would be uh, perceived in a different way uh, or misunderstood. And so... <laughs> So there was a lot of those those things throughout, but uh, but I ended up not changing a word of it, and I ended up being glad that I didn't because I said what I wanted to say. Um, and no, this church is actually an organism, not a business. It's not an organization. It's an organism that consists of people, supposedly with changed hearts. And until we stand in our truth, and that's why I love your book. Thank you. Because it lets you see the truth. And until we see who we actually are, we will never, well, some of us won't change anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it should shed a light on a Christian and make their hearts change. And, and we have to answer a question Am I doing enough? Yeah. And then speak. We, we've seen so much in the last couple of years of hatred and evil, but are we speaking out, or is are we just agreeing with it, or are we just going along and saying nothing? But the church is an organism. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's just people. Um, and can I say something real quick about that because it reminded me of something. Um, but but it also, you know, the thing that I, when I first wrote this book, I was like. It's all about silence. We've got to break the silence. And then, you know, in the last couple of years, a lot of silence has been broken, right? But it's not necessary. So simply saying stuff out loud or writing it on Twitter or on Facebook is not the answer necessarily. But how we say these things becomes really important because a lot of times we say things in ways that you do more damage than they do good. So, I mean, I think, again, it's from speaking with the heart, it's from having conversations, it's from getting to know people, um, and not as others, but people, you know, and so, um, and, and, you know, just being true to that. So how we say things is also as important as saying things. You, you probably answered my question, but I was going to ask you about five minutes ago to bring this to today, and how many of the us white folks and white churches are still silent and they use the separation of church and state as their excuse for not saying or doing anything and yet my understanding of the historically black churches uh, they talk about these things a lot and yet we're the ones that also need to be talking and, then, and breaking the silence, but I don't know how to do that. Maybe you yeah, can shed your opinion. I hear that a lot too, and I think it's a cop out. I think it's a complete cop out. Um, you're not going to lose your status as a church because a preacher spoke politics from the pulpit. Otherwise, uh, you know, the uh, particularly evangelical churches, which have become quite critical, 
um, would, have, would have lost theirs. And, and it's funny to me, particularly if you just look at that moment in time in the civil rights movement uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, when, you know, um, Dr. King was holding, you know, that's why the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed. It wasn't shut down by the IRS. It was, uh, you know, the uh, it was tr you know training young people in the art of uh, of nonviolence and and um, and reasons to protest and not to just go out willy nilly, but to, you know, all of these things were being done in black churches. Black churches changed the world from you know by embracing political the political movement and um, black preachers, you know. And, and so, you know, I think it's a choice. It's, I mean, in, in my mind, it's, it's a choice. I mean, it's a safe choice. Uh, it, it, if you want to be, you know, if, if safety is your concern, you don't talk about it. And my dad, again, he would, he would use a lot of parables. I mean, he would, he, he would, he would, you know, give the Good Samaritan every couple of weeks, it seemed like to me, you know, with the hope, you know, that, that, that the, you know, that, that the racist sitting in the front row would understand, oh, he's talking about me. But, um, <laughs> but the racist in the front row never figured out he was talking about him. Because sometimes the parable works great, and sometimes you need a rhetorical baseball bat, as we say. Um, so, um, but, but, but it's a fine line, you know. Again, you know, trust me, uh, you know, it, when somebody calls you an idiot, it never, ever tells changes your point of view, right? <laughs> and because um, I, I get that a lot. But, um, <laughs> but you also can never tell, you know, you can never convince somebody to be more um, open-minded by calling them a racist. I mean, you, you have to be careful about it. I mean, you have, you have to, to, to uh, you know, use your word carefully. Um, so. You mentioned that uh, there were I think you said 40 bombings in Birmingham. 40, I should have said 40 bombs, not all of them went off. Between 40 bombings, do we know if there were any fatalities besides the, the four young girls? Uh, um, there, 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 were, uh, there were not in the bombings, there were a lot of injuries, and there were some miracles that took place too. Fred Shuttlesworth was bombed three times. Um, the, the, but that was... That, that I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, were the first fatalities. There were a lot of racially motivated killings, uh, but not uh, not the bombings. Thank you. But it, it was, you know, uh, there were people who were killed because of the bombings. Uh, there, there was a bombing at Arthur Shore's house, who was a civil rights lawyer, and in West Birmingham in the, in the neighborhood known as Dynamite Hill because of the number of bombings. Um, and uh, one, he was bombed a couple of times and, and in the aftermath of that, uh, uh, a black man was shot by police and the initial uh, report was he was shot because he was bursting through a door with a gun, but it, as it turned out, he was unarmed and coming out of his door across the street. So. I mean, there, there, there was a lot. I mean, it was, you know, it was crazy times. But, um, but yeah. Which Somebody kept, else? Which kept people silent. Absolutely. Who said what? Which kept people silent. Right. Absolutely. It also, it kept a lot of people silent. It also motivated others to speak. I just want to make y'all aware of a potential resource for helping get yourself past the racism that we've all lived and what we can and can't come down and see. Related to the churches, the Episcopalian National Church had the first time. I'm going to stand over here. You want to come up here? No, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I told John about this already. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm not a member of the Episcopalian Church, but I have participated in what they do uh, to help us get past some of these things and to come to terms with some of these things. It's called Sacred Ground. In fact, one of my 
club member who's here today. Louise, if you want to talk with her about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an intense thing, and it's not, it's a 10 session, two hours per session effort. The material is difficult. It is only for white people because it's about help, <coughs> helping us to come to terms with things. Um, if you're interested in doing this, not every Episcopalian church is doing it, but if you'll call the Church of the Nativity, if you're really interested, I'll talk with you more. I think Louise will too if she has, if you can get to her. Um, it really, it really is an eye-opening experience. And so if you're dedicated, if you really want to, that would be something I'd do when I call Church of Nativity to get signed up. And for more info. Thank you. Sorry to take over the yeah, you know, it's funny to me, um, just a second, um, when, they, when, I, when this book first came out and I started, I started seeing that they were putting it in the religious section of bookstores, I was like, damn, there's going to be some There's going to be some people who are not getting what they bargained for. But, uh, but, but as, as a result of it, you know, I, I found myself speaking in churches a lot. Um, and I go through groups, you know, talk to groups who are really beginning to talk about these issues. And, you know, largely white churches. Um, sometimes churches, all white churches, and sometimes, and, um, and, and at first I was just startled at how um, at the selective memory I think of, of what had taken place and how uh, you know the, the stories that I you know come to think as common knowledge are just forgotten uh, about the about the movement itself and about the violence associated with it but then what started to grow on me was there was a real unexpected to me um, sort of thirst for not necessarily knowing all those details, but but for making change. And it's why I said that thing about the the black church training people in nonviolence and when to protest because I was at one church and. And a woman who was who, who got up, a white woman who got up and said she was completely changed by this group she'd been meeting in, and and, um, and so she stood up and said, "When do we protest?" And um, and so I said, "You know, well, what do you want to protest about?" And she said, "I don't know, but when do we protest?" <laughs> and, and and so I mean. Yeah, which I digressed again, but I mean, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to say leap up and protest when you don't know what you're protesting, um, but to speak what's on your heart and to, and to be honest with yourself about who you are. And you are what you pretend to be, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. How many of us in this room feel like there is a um, just holding you down, just pushing you down, not to say what you know in your heart is the right thing. We get warned about it. don't talk politics, don't talk, you know, don't mention politics. And politics has drawn a line, and we are standing in the we are standing in fear. All of us are standing in fear. And the first time I experienced it was during the Civil Rights Movement when I was afraid and I spoke out. Every time I got sp spoke out, I got be beaten back down, but I kept speaking out. And I appreciate what you have done with this book. This is a come to Jesus meeting. It is. It really is. Look at humanity. Look at kindness. Look at love and embrace it. Jesus was in a political situation too, back in the day. So, thank you very much for being my favorite Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, that says a lot about a lot of Alabamians. <laughs>
But I want, I mean, y'all answer that question she asked at first. How many of y'all felt that thumb keeping you silent? Oh. And well, somebody tell me how, how you got, got me on that. Your book did for me because I came from California. I've been there for 30 years and experienced it. Never has the word silence truly been expressed the way you expressed it and brought it all to the surface for me. And it all, I'm now too old. I'm bark around, but by God, I'm ready. <laughs> In spite of the dog. <laughs> well, anybody else have an answer to that? Let me ask you a question. It's a little diverse, but you know, we live in a diverse community here. Uh, Huntsville is not part of Alabama. <laughs> I'll tell Mo that. <laughs> That's still your punchline? No, I often tell people I live in the state of Huntsville in the country of Alabama <laughs> because we are different. Uh, all you have to do is look at the license plates every day. Uh, every, every state. You know, maybe I'll just hear out springs. Well, is that all right? You'll find out. <laughs> well, I, yeah, what I was trying to say is in Huntsville, we try hard to make a difference because of the people we have here. And we don't always please them. It's always a, a challenge. Uh, my challenge right now is how do we get voting rights for all of us? Um, my wife and I tried to do a, a absentee voting in South Alabama. That didn't work. We came all the way to Huntsville and had to go through a two or three hour process to vote at the local uh, courthouse. Uh, most people won't do that. And when I see the voting rights exercise in the United States right now, they are going to do away with some of the hours of Sunday voting, which we don't have. They're going to do away with uh, registering to vote by mail, which we don't have. And then I hear the governor tell us sometimes, <clears throat> you have to vote for this person because he's our guy. And we don't get a choice sometimes. So my question is, how, how, do, how do what people like here who have, who have a, an interest in doing the right thing make a change in Alabama like redistricting right now where everybody is? going to go back to the good old days and keep the districts the way they are. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, it is a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, it's in, in a lot of ways... Squeeze it from the bottom. In a lot of ways, I feel like, uh, you know, being born in 1963, you know, by the time I was really aware of anything, it was the 70s. Um, and while it was, we still had a long way to go, a lot of this was in the rearview mirror and changes seemed to be mixed, being made and I've never really been able to put my head where it would have been in the 60s and the 50s. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand looking at pictures of those white mobs uh, attacking Fred Shuttlesworth outside, you know, Phillips High School. I couldn't put myself in those positions of imagining that that could be occurring in this place that I, you know, um, despite it all, I still managed to love. And um, I can't say that anymore because I feel like I understand in ways now um, more than I've ever stood in, understood in my life because I've seen in the last few years the uh, uh, people feel like they've been permission, they've been given permission to express uh, the racism they once had the decency to be ashamed of, and um, and so we see that we see those mobs, we see uh, anger, we see voting rights restrictions, we see and you know the, the last half of this book is about you know the first half is really about race, the last half is about 
Uh, you know, it's how my dad dealt with my brother coming out uh, as gay in 1973 when he was at First Methodist Church of Decatur, and which was a different time, of course, and and how the Methodist Church is now and using much the same is about to split using the same rhetoric that was used in 1965 to deny uh, uh, integration. So, um, so in my view, a lot of the principles that apply then apply now to all of these issues because because the issues may be slightly different, the issues may be very different, the issues may be exactly the same, um, but um, it, I think the call from, you know, uh, from King anyway, is um, people of goodwill to use their voice and to say what they think. Um, and to and to use whatever pulpit you have, and you have a pulpit. We all got pulpits, even if it's a, my crazy uncle Larry's at Thanksgiving, you know. But um, but I, mean, I think the answer is not to expect miracles, but to simply be true to yourself and to be willing to simply say I disagree, uh, or to write your governor and say, I, with all respect, I wish you. You know, pay more attention to your heart than your polls, because I think that in a lot of cases that's the answer. But I mean, I don't know if it doesn't make any difference because, because uh, you know, for yourselves, and um, and politics is is a lot more marketing than it is anything else. Well, I, I know, for example, we're rewriting the constitution right now. It's my understanding that a new constitution has been given to the to the state to look at. No, look at it. Well, no, no, it's no, it's not a new constitution. It's a rewrite of the constitution. existing 1901 constitution. It is not a new constitution. Well, they took out all of the. Well, yeah. they, they, they I've, been, I've been planning a project on that. They they they, they could have taken out the racist language, sure. but. The racist language doesn't matter. Right. The intent yeah. matters, and the intent remains intact. That's the right. intent is what keeps uh, is a real problem. And, and so, you know, I'm a huge hater of our current constitution uh, and uh, and the way in which it was passed. Which, if you haven't ever read uh, the John B. Knott, he was a, the the, uh, the the president of the Constitutional Convention in 1901. If you haven't ever read the speech he gave leading into that. Please read it. It's um, on the internet. And uh, but my problem is, and I, this may be one of the things that may, there may be two things that I disagree with Larry about. But um, but this is why everybody says let's let's rewrite the Constitution. And um, and I just don't know because you know do I trust those guys in Montgomery to do that right now? <laughs> any, any more than I trust the 1901. At least they were up front about it, you know. So, uh, but, 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 you know, that's a cop out too, because you got to act. So I'm not from Alabama. I moved here a year ago, and I, I can't help but share a quick story. I grew up in South Mississippi, and um, as you probably are aware, if you're not, the Mississippi flag recently changed. Um, so when I was 18 years old, I'm 36, so when I was 18 is the first time that we had a vote on the Mississippi flag. And at that time it voted no to a change. Well, ever since I was 18, I moved, I lived in California, I lived in Virginia, I got married, I had a child, I came back home, we're still talking about the same issue. Except at this point, it has grown and um, the, the will has, it, it's public awareness. Right? And at some point we got a, a new car tag, a car tag dedicated to aligning yourself with the movement, right? Like my generation wanted a new flag. And so we built a car tag. We had pins. There was a nonprofit created. And it took from the time I was 18 to the time I was 36 years old that Mississippi now has a new flag. And I think it's um, understanding who you are, what you want to say, it goes back to your idea of not being silent. But finding a way to express yourself and align yourself with others who feel the same way 
to to sway the masses. I've said this before. You have people on this side who really want it this way, people on this side who really want it this way, and a majority in the middle who really doesn't know what they want or doesn't know how to express that. And so it's only through being able to verbalize yourself and align yourself to have an impact to be able to see that change move. So I just wanted to share. I think it's a good example. Well, that's a good point. And um, the other thing too is. And, and, you know, you know, we're so polarized right now for so many reasons. Um, so people automatically judge based on one word or two words you use, where you fall politically and write you off or write you in accordingly. And so for me, uh, I, mean, I hate that because, I mean, my whole career I've tried to be, you know, you know, people that people, young people still forget that you know Democrats were ran the state until 2010, essentially, and um, and uh, you know, and when they were in power, they didn't like me any more than Republicans liked me. You know? <laughs> so, um, which I took great pride in, you know? but it's so much harder to do that now because you get put in a box so fast, and and so for me, the most convincing arguments uh, never use any kind of political jargon or talking points at all. I mean, the, I mean, the things that are important to me are, are decency and that everybody gets, uh, you know, an equal shape and that, um, and that we try to make true those, uh, you know, myths about America that we were taught in school, you know, that we, it's, that it's a goal that we, you know, someday reach the, the, the Equality we promise, and um, and so it, it you know and of course uh, I'll stick in for me the opposing corruption kind of thing, um, but you know I mean if we stick if it's about that I mean surely there's common ground. Um, if we make it about politics, then I mean I understand people have to be about politics because other you have to work as you say to get things done or else you're just talking but but in terms of persuasion uh, I think the more we can make it a political I mean and just human you know about humanity and decency and goodness um, maybe the better off we are. John, uh, to answer the gentleman's question and the two people back out the I'm a sort of school teacher, I think I can talk about it. <laughs> but to, to piggyback off the gentleman's question, uh, I worked for a congressman. I worked for more than 18 years, more, uh, a few months. <laughs>
Um, there, there's a chapter in there. It's the most controversial chapter in the book. I think, <laughs> called the Moccasin Massacre of 1998. Um, but I don't know how I can talk about it uh, other than to say uh, it's not for the queasy, shall I say? <laughs> but I actually, I was, I was, it's, okay, so there's a, a lot of the book is built about around sort of camp experiences. And we had a little cabin up in North Georgia for generations. Um, and uh, we'd go up there and my kids were real little. And, um, and so where they would wait in the creek below the waterfall, every day. On the first day of that time, I saw this giant water moccasin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was giant. And we usually, there's tons of snakes up there, but usually not poisonous ones. And so I was haunted in my dreams by this thing. And um, literally for days. And then ultimately, to make a very long story short, I ended up, well, I won't give it all away, but I killed it and uh, decided in one of my uh, poor decisions, <laughs> that I would bring it home to the kids and show them how to, you know, skin a snake, and to reveal my serious bravery to my wife, and, um, who was not impressed at all. <laughs> but when I cut the thing in, I was like, "Oh, it's look, it's look, it looks like it's eating something, right?" And I stuffed in my little Swiss Army knife in. And, and baby snakes started pouring out. <laughs> and there was a large number of them who were summarily executed with a Swiss Army knife, but, um, but it's, hopefully there's more to it than that. And, um, but I called my editor, I mean, I, right after I turned it in, and, and I told my editor, I think maybe we ought to cut that out because um, I'm not sure it really fits. And she's like, no. But it's controversial. There are people who say, who just hate it, couldn't read it, skipped it. And then there are people who say the best line in the book's in there. So. <laughs> I don't know. You, back in the back, you still got that question? Oh, yeah. Oh. But yeah, the, yeah, thank you so much for, for everything. I mean, I, I look forward to reading your book. And um, so, you know, one question I had was in, uh, in your life or experiences, if you like dealt with people of other religions, like Hindus, Muslims, Jews, or others, because the, as, as you know, you, yeah, with, with the truth is like with different religions, everyone like uh, like we're, we're all one in a way, and and like you know one of the worst experiences is my alma mater, Birmingham Southern, is like hearing, hearing like so someone like criticize my religion, saying Christianity is the way to go, which I swear is totally not. Right? And everyone can understand. And, all our religions can be respected, and which is the truth. And it's so interesting with, with different religions. I mean, they all preach the same thing, but they're still fighting. With, and so I was wondering how you dealt with the, in your life with other religions and everything on, on these crucial political and social matters. I mean, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, you know, it's, in particular, you know, in a place that proclaims freedom of religion, which means it's okay to be Methodist or Baptist. Um, but, um, you know, it's funny that one, well, uh, you know, it, to me, it, it, uh, it's meant to, to relate to all of that. You know, I've got, I've got a friend who's a reporter in India, and she's, we joke all the time that, uh, and she's Hindu, and, um, I mean, we just joke all the time because the similarities in oppression uh, and in government action are so often similar in Alabama and in parts of India, then, and so we can really sort of understand and relate to each other in that way. We got, but after I wrote this book, there's also a, a pretty well-known uh, rabbi by the name of Jonathan Miller who lived in Birmingham for a long time, and, uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, um, this. And, and, he, and he, he talked about the, some of the same issues as well, but also, interestingly, he, he was talking about when he was growing up, his father was a, a very outspoken rabbi in the Midwest, and one who came um, south on uh, uh, what was essentially a, um, a freedom rider, as a freedom rider, and was jailed in Mississippi, and 
Uh, and, and it was interesting that he, it, it, he talked about how much damage that did to his family and all that. It was, wasn't meant to say that this was wrong, but that the, it, what's, what this has done in talking to, uh, you know, people in different faiths who have said at least that when they took a look at this, it, it changed the way they talked to their flock, as it were, whatever. Um, but so, for me, it's, it's, you know, I speak from the language I know that's, met, that's you know, grown up as a Methodist preacher, but, but it should apply across the board. Uh, um, and, you know, again, like I said, we grew up in this place, in this bubble, where the Methodists were the good ones. But they didn't tell us that Bull Connor was a Methodist or that, or that George Wallace was a Methodist and, uh, and all this. So, you know, the good ones always tends to be the people like us. And that's what this is supposed to say is that, A, we aren't always the good ones, and B, um, it shouldn't be about us and them. It should be about all of us. You know, and so hopefully that message gets across in some way. It's certainly, certainly what I intended to. Methodist prayer. Yeah, I got a prayer. Help us, Jesus, or somebody else. <laughs> thank you, thank it, you. Thank well, well, I should have done a different one. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, help us God. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs>